Thank you, uh, Steve, for connecting with us today. It's, uh, I'm excited to uh, have you here. We're very lucky to have you here. Um, very inspirational. Um, those that uh, have seen you online will know that you are someone of uh, great importance in education. And, Already? Um, oh, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, those that have met you in person, read your books, uh, interacted with you online, or um, heard you as a keynote um, will understand what a, what a powerhouse you are. And uh, so welcome and thanks for joining us. So I guess to start with, just tell us a bit about yourself, Steve, and I guess who inspired you uh, to be who you are today? Uh, well, I'll start with the second for important, isn't it, that um, teachers inspire. And I think uh, I teach very much. My, my, the teacher who inspired me was a teacher who was an American teacher who I had when I was in uh, in my last couple of years uh, in Holland, when I was 15, 16 years old, before I left to go to college. And, and um, he was called Mr. Domain. He was um, quite, a, I suppose, a liberal type of teacher. <laughs> and in, the, in them days, it was interesting because the curriculum was, was very gender biased. Um, met, uh, boys couldn't um, take the girly subjects like art and music and home economics. Uh, you, you could do one, but you couldn't do three. And the girls couldn't do three sciences, so they could only do one. But we had to do all three, chemistry, physics, and biology. Uh, so the girls used to do biology, and the boys used to do music, and that was it. But I wanted to do, to do music and art. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of, um, I found a way of, of, um, of getting out of PE, physical, physical ed education, and um, mitching off and doing uh, music. And he was the music teacher, music and drama teacher. And I said to him, Larry, because we were allowed to call him by his first name. Said, Larry, can can I come and sit in the back of your class? He said, Yeah, you can. You can't do the exams, he said, because you're not registered as a student. But you can sit in the back if you like. And that that is what inspired me the most to be a rebel, I suppose, really, and to <laughs> and to kind of break the rules and, and to see how far I could push things. And now I, I taking risks and, and um, yeah, I, I, my mantra is I'd rather um, you know ask for forgiveness than permission. You know, I just do things and oh, I absolutely know, love know, it. There you go. So that, that was my inspiration. And I suppose my background, um, I started off in art and design, as you'd expect, and I, I was a musician for a while, and, and I ran a, uh, an independent record label back in the 80s in the UK, in the punk scene. And uh, I, I was also involved in technical work, and then I decided to retrain and become a psychologist. And um, at that point, I got into teaching, and then into research, and then finally into the university where I am now. And so uh, Lots of strings to my bow. Master of all, you know. Sorry, but Jack of all trades and master of none. I think is the <laughs> absolutely brilliant. I guess uh, one of the things I read online was that you describe yourself as a disruptive activist. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I think disruption is good because often we, um, we we stagnate. We we get into a very conservative position in schools and colleges and universities where oh, this is. If, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, this, this is um, how we've been doing it forever. This is the, the, the way we've always done it, so why do we have to change now? But I think change is important, especially seeing society is changing very rapidly. And, um, you know, the needs of society, the needs of work, the needs of employers are changing. Business is changing. It's changing. Technology is driving a lot of it, and I think we need to be in a position where we embrace disruption and turn it to our advantage and that's what being a disruptive and an, um, activist means for me it, it means kind of um, trying to help people to embrace change and trying to help them to to see that disruption is actually a good thing it's going to change you know practices into excellent practices um, so so I mean that, that I think is the that's in a nutshell how I see it great and um, I guess on that track to do with inspiration and uh, innovation to you, what is innovation, and how does it relate to educational technology, I guess, in the schools and educational organizations that um, all of us see ourselves in? Innovation, um, it's an interesting word, isn't it? It means a lot of things to a lot of people. For me, it means being able to do something different or better, not just with what you've got, but with what is coming as well. And that means we have to anticipate change, we have to anticipate uh, new trends. Uh, that doesn't mean being a futurist. That means um, just looking at the trends and, and watching the signs about where things are going. And, and then, you know, just trying to, to change things in, in useful ways, ways that make a difference, make an impact. So, so for instance, Twitter's not new. 
Twitter's been around for a long time. Facebook's not new. It's been around even longer, 10, 11 years now. Um, but I, I've, I and other people are finding new ways to use them all the time. Um, so, for instance, in my classrooms, uh, I have a, a live screen up with Twitter feed on it. We, we select a hashtag for each lesson, which is unique. The students use it, and they're encouraged to use it to not just um, talk to each other, but to ask questions and to challenge and to tweet up stuff they find which is useful, and it all goes up onto the screen. If I find stuff that um, is useful or challenging that they're actually tweeting while the le lecture's going on, then I'll retweet it to uh, my followers, and um, some incredible things happen, because what's happening then is the walls of the classroom essentially are, are no longer there. They're, at, they're breaking the walls down, and, and what's happening is they are connecting with a worldwide community of experts out there who can guide them and inspire them even more than I can by being in the room. I and, and that's me is innovation. That's fantastic. And I, I guess in your opinion, what should teachers or educators be doing in order to be more innovative? Because people are always saying um, you need to be more innovative, innovation is the key. What do educators need to be doing? Well, firstly, you need to think creatively and think about what problems there are to solve. Um, it's no good bringing technology in if there's no problems to solve. You know, people buy technology because it's there, and, and that's a stupid idea. Um, you should see what the problems are and then try and find what technologies are available to to solve the problem. So this year, for instance, uh, my, my new students who I'm meeting in a couple of weeks' time, they're in for a treat because we're bringing in things like robotics and uh, Makey Makey and um, uh, Raspberry Pi and various other, you know, programmable devices and um, we're, we're going to be teaching a whole new curriculum essentially. That, that to me is, is what teachers should be doing, always looking for new ways to inspire, new ways to engage, new ways to encourage and, and um, you know, uh, essentially to, to get students to, to, to fall in love with learning. That to me is the essence of good teaching. Okay. And uh, do you think you can teach innovation? Um, it's the same question as can you teach creativity. I, I think we've, we've got it in us already. It's innate, but it needs to be awakened. Mm. It's like prodding a fire. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the warmth, the heat is already there, but to prod it, you, you add oxygen and then boom, up it goes. Uh, where you can unleash people's innovation, unleash their creativity. I think those two words are very, very closely aligned. Yeah, it's good. And, and if, I guess, Picture yourself in a classroom now as a teacher, maybe an elementary or a high school, I guess. What would you do and how would you actively encourage innovation? Well, kids today, um, as you know and as I know and as parents all over the world know, um, have that, that innovative tool in their pocket. They carry it around with them or in their handbags or whatever. And lots of schools sadly still ban these devices in the classroom or they, they discourage their use anyway. I know innovative teachers who are finding new ways to use mobile phones, cell phones, to actually unleash new new ways of learning. And I think one of the things teachers need to be aware of is, look, these kids are coming into the classroom with tools that they are intimately familiar with. You don't need to teach them how to use them. They know how to use them better than we ever do. Um, what you need to do is to find ways to harness those tools so that instead of using them for distracting purposes or for sexting or for you know, all the, the nefarious stuff they use them for, let's actually focus their use into really good pedagogical ways of teaching and learning. And, and to me, that is one of the ultimate things we need to, to think about. Now, I'm bringing a new book out in uh, January, um, and my last line there, I think, is we literally hold the future in our own hands, which is, you know, it's the mobile phone. Absolutely. It's a smartphone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that, fantastic. And I, I think it's something that sadly isn't as common as it should be in, in classrooms and schools around the world. Um, recently, I blogged about um, my uh, top five trends or resources to start a new school year. What do you see at the moment as being the top five trends, as you mentioned before, um, for a teacher in an innovative 21st century classroom? Well, I, I read your blog post and I think I retweeted it a few times as well because <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I was very interested to see what you and I'm interested to hear what other teachers also um, think of their top five um, tools. Well, phone, smart mobile. Uh, that's going to be a game changer. Uh, number two, we've got to have social media. Um, in, a, in an environment which allows um, young people to be able to access not just 
great resources, but also other, you know, great people, you know, who, who I mentioned earlier on to you, you know, people that we can bring into the classroom through these social media. Number three, I think, um, has got to be um, making and learning through making. Mm -hmm. So, so tools for making. Um, I was talking to a head teacher yesterday up on Plymouth Hoa, who I hadn't seen for years. He, he was, um, he's a, a Welsh head teacher, and uh, he was talking to me about Lego and about the power of building and making things. And so Seymour Papert's work on constructionism, you know, the idea of um, you build and you understand the concepts by, by making and, 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 and um, pulling things to pieces and examining them and putting them together again. That's what kids are interested in doing, but, but it's also a really strong pedagogical tool. So that's number three. Um, number four, I, I, I think, um, you know, connecting with others in other, other cultures. Um, we've got an incredibly dangerous situation going on all over the world right now. You know, people fighting each other and people killing each other um, in the name of religion, in the name of, you know, politics and so on. Um, one of the important things we've got to do is educate our young people that that's, that's certainly not the best way to go about things. The best way to go about things is to learn and understand about each other, understand about diversity and understand about what the problems are in other parts of the world. So, so I think connecting... What we used to do um, when I was at school was pen pals. Yeah. Um, write, write to, to stu students in other countries who were the same age as you and learn their language, learn all about them. So I had pen pals in France, I had pen pals in America um, and, and elsewhere in the UK. And, and um, we learned a tremendous amount about that. Nowadays, it's at the speed of thought. So you can connect with people, what I'm, I know call e-pals. You, know, you can connect with people all over the world. Um, Dave Mitchell's quad blogging mm. idea is, is incredible. Uh, because it connects four different schools together and each school blogs and the others read and, and comment. And mm. That way kids get to learn to write better, but they also get to learn about other cultures as well. And finally, for me, um, probably the most important tool for me personally, and I think a lot of my students find this useful as well, is blogging itself, which I mentioned just now. The idea of blogging, it's not just about putting your ideas down and understanding them better yourself and clarifying your thoughts, which helps. It's also about sharing them with a worldwide audience and getting back lots of comments which may or may not agree with you. You learn a, a, a tremendous amount from that. That's fantastic. No, all five just resonate with me so well. It's, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Um, at the moment, my grade seven students are investigating uh, modern learning environments, trying to change our, our very old school style building into a modern yeah. learning environment. What do you see as the link between uh, technology and modern, and lear modern learning environments? And what would you include in your dream classroom? A bit of advice for some of these students, I guess. Well, one of the things I take out is the ICT suite. Yeah. Do away with it completely because it, it, it grounds children into a place. And, you know, computing is done everywhere now. You know, we send a, a false message to kids that this is the place where computing is done. Actually, no, it's not. Computing can be done anywhere. It can be done in your hand. It can be done, you know, outside in, in, in the fields or in the woods or whatever. You know, it can be done anywhere now. Um, and so I, I do away with the ICT suite. Um, I'm very inclined to agree with people like Stephen Heppel, who um, you, you and many others will have heard of, his work, work on um, uh, learning spaces and, and you know, design thinking is, is incredible. And he says things like, you know, putting in different lighting. So, so in the mornings when kids need to be woken up, you, um, you, you use red lighting because red actually, you know, makes you wake up. Whereas in the afternoon, maybe when they need to be calmed down a bit, you put blue lighting in. It's a simple idea, but he's shown that it actually works. He does other things like, um, you know, when kids kind of look out the window, and there's a window just here, right, right to the side of me here with the sun kind of coming through at the moment. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm inclined to look out the window, but it distracts me. Yeah. Um, and, and kids get distracted easily by things that are going on. I was always distracted when I was in school. Um, so Heppel talks about, you know, just putting things onto the window not necessarily covering the windows, but just putting writing onto the window so that their, their eyesight stops there, it doesn't go past. You know, these are very, very simple ideas. Other ideas like um, getting kids to take their shoes off. They ain't going to fight each other when they've got no shoes on. They yeah. can't very easily kick each other, can they? You know, these very, very simple ideas, but very, very powerful. And, and um, these are ideas, I think, that will be in the future of education and, and will change our learning spaces into something more conducive. Think ahead, I guess, to the future, the years 2020 or 2025. What does uh, the futuristic classroom look like? Uh, how are students learning? What's different? 
technologies, etc., in the future of the classroom, classroom of the future. There's a caveat here because if I'm going to start um, talking about the future, I've got to warn everybody that it's um, just my opinion, and uh, uh, it's very difficult to predict more than a year down the road. I, I worked with the Horizon report on one one um, report a few years ago, and. Uh, what they normally ask you to do is to sit around a virtual table and decide with everybody else what are the top two um, new trends that are going to be, you know, widespread by a year's time and then two to three years time and then three to five years time. And uh, it was easy to predict the first year. Then the second to third years um, were more difficult. By the time we got to the fourth and fifth years, it was um, it was virtually impossible to actually you know, to, to, because you know. It, Ray Kurzweil, the, uh, the futurist, he says uh, change is no longer linear; it's exponential. You know, and that means you know there's a J curve, you know, that, that's going on. And so we've got to be really careful how we project into the future. But let, let's talk about um, what my imagination for um, what six six years time, maybe five or six years yeah. time. Um, I think um, we're going to be in a place where touchscreen technologies. Are no longer useful. I think they're an interim technology. I think they're a transitory technology. They're, they're the link between our keyboard and mouse, which we've had for, for, for a long, long time, and the gestural, um, facial, and voice recognition technologies that are on the verge of becoming um, the next big thing. Um, I, I was called into a TV studio to, uh, to um, answer some questions a couple of years ago, and, and um, it was the time when all the schools were starting to buy iPads for, for um, you know for, for kids, and the you know, Taxpayers Alliance and parents and all sorts of people were up in arms about it, saying, you know, this is a waste of money and it's ridiculous and all this kind of stuff. And um, the woman said to me, is, are iPads, are touchscreen technologies, tablets, are they the future of education? And I said, no, they're the present. Yeah. The, the future will be when you, the future will be when your kids sit on your lap and say, "Mum, did you really have to touch your computer to make it work?" <laughs> you know, and, and you know, I think we've got to be aware of that. You know, things like Xbox 360 Connect and, and various other gestural computer kind of interfaces—they're going to become the norm. Uh, I, I think in about four to five years, maybe six years time. Um, that's my opinion. I may be wrong. You know, yeah. you, people. Look, <laughs> Watching this in 2020, thinking, "What an idiot!" You know, <laughs> but but that, that's what I see at the moment happening. And um, when you think about it, um, computers that you don't have to um, carry around with you, you know, I, what I mean is you don't have bulky things to carry around with you. They're, they'll they'll be kind of maybe woven into your or into your clothes, or maybe even you know wearing you're wearing them in some way, or maybe you're interfacing with the the walls and and, and the floors and the ceiling around you. Um, of the classroom or, or, or your house or whatever, I think that's where we're going to see the future. Already we know about things like um, these massive um, screen technologies that are rollable. You know, you can roll them up and take them away with you. And you, you unroll them, stick them onto a wall, they become the wall, and it does away with big screen technologies. Um, we know that exists already. It's just expensive at the moment, but I see schools being equipped with these things as well in the future. And um, I, I see teachers being able to control um, the room with just a, you know, maybe just their hands or their voice through these technologies. Um, one of my um, uh, musician um, musicians I was talking to you about the other day. You know, this is, uh, yesterday, in fact, he he he, um, he was my, he's my drummer actually. He's also my son-in-law, <laughs> and uh, he, he's um, a bit of a tech freak. He works for British Telecom, um, and uh, he's got this um, this small tablet device which he can control um, all of the instruments and all of the sound levels from in his lap you know or in his hands anywhere in, in the concert hall he just presses it you know presses up on the screen and up comes the volume of the kick drum or whatever you know um, that's just the start mm. that's just the start of what we can possibly do with various um, tools and technologies yeah. I don't I don't think it's just to be going to be about technologies either it's also going to be about things like experiences so I think we're going to be, be seeing a lot of um, uh, trips to museums and art galleries and, and out into the wild and various other places where context of where um, devices can be used. Oh, I think it's um, very exciting to even think uh, one yeah. or two years ahead and I completely agree trying to think yeah. uh, five or six years ahead is uh, near on impossible at the moment. Um, we talked before about uh, your new book which I, I guess ties into a lot of the discussion we've, we've had today. Um, I guess 
it's it's really important for us to to know it's coming out in January, and I think uh, I'm for one very excited about it. You being a very inspirational person and. Uh, education to to find out what it's about. I guess what are some of the things for us to expect in January when uh, your book does come out? Uh, well, it's it's interesting um, venture because it's um, I don't think it's been done before. What I've done is I've taken some of my blog posts and I've written more commentary and you know annotations around them, and I've included um, uh, co commentary uh, and, and also discussion from people who read my blog. So in effect, I've, I've included lots of people from my um, professional learning environment. I mean, you might you might even appear in there. I don't know yet. Right? You know, we'll see. We'll see whether one of your comments appears in there. But um, essentially, what I've done is I've tried to put together um, 14 chapters, which look at, um, at my my own philosophy on, on education. I talk about things like digital praxis, for instance. Uh, a lot of teachers will will not be that familiar with what praxis is, but but praxis is a really important concept. It's it's the, the melding together of theory and practice. It's where it's that sweet spot where theory and practice combine, and a lot of um, teachers maybe aren't aware of this, um, but they should be because it's an important idea which I think um, all educators really need to understand. I also talk about global educators, the idea that we can all become global educators now. We can all use technology to reach beyond the walls of our classroom mm. and educate people worldwide, um, and. I talk about things like openness and open scholarship. You know, the, the idea that um, uh, you can put a Creative Commons license on all your work, and it's available free to anybody. Anybody can then use it or repurpose it um, to learn from. And, and um, in, in, a, in a time when you know we have an economic crisis, and in, in a time where you know everyone needs knowledge, I, I think it's perverse not to give it away for free. So, so I give all my content away for free, and it, because it's repurposable, people are translating it into other languages. So a lot of my blogs and um, uh, slideshows on SlideShare are, are, are being translated into Spanish, for instance, and then the whole of Latin America is That's able fantastic. to read my stuff. You know, it's, I couldn't buy that kind of no. um, uh, promotion. You know, That's amazing. <laughs> so uh, these are the kind of things I talk about in my book, and, and um, some of it will be old hat to some people; others, will, other, other stuff will be new, perhaps. Um, Ultimately, I, I, it's about um, theory and practice in the digital age. You know, educational theory and practice in the digital age is actually the, the strap line. And, you know, surprise, surprise, it's called learning with ease. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Um, Steve, I, I will tie it up there, but I just want to say thank you so much for being a uh, Truly inspirational. Uh, I mean, it's so so great to be able to connect. And, and you talked about connectedness and, and being able to connect via Twitter. Within 48 hours, we've we've hooked up a Skype ch Skype chat, connected, chatted about inspiration in, in your life and and what you're doing. Um, so I just want to say thank you. It's been an honour to connect with you today. And uh, I guess any parting words or advice or inspiration for my PLN when uh, I throw this out there in a few days' time. Uh, well, keep the faith. Go out there and be inspirational. Make a difference.